Hi, everybody. My name is Jay Wetter. Welcome to the webinar. We're going to start officially in about two minutes. So stand by. While you're waiting, you could um, tell me who you are and where you're from in the chat if you want. And you can get familiar with the Q&A button to the right of that, and that's where you will ask your questions. All right, let's get going. Welcome to the second episode in our Canola Watch Winter Webinar Series. My name is Jay Wetter, and I'm here on behalf of the four host organizations, the Canola Council of Canada, Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, and Alberta Canola. The topic today is maximizing hybrid potential, targeting traits to improve yield and consistency. In this webinar, we will learn about the value of clubroot resistant hybrids, genetic testing to choose black leg resistance genes, the new pod shatter rating system, and how to prioritize traits for each field. We have four presenters, Brittany Vischer, Clinton Yerke, Nicola Dow, and Aaron Willenberg. After the presentations, we will have a Q&A we want your questions, so please use the Q&A feature below to pose them. Use the chat function to connect with other attendees. And note that attendees can get a CCA credit, and we'll provide the code later in the event. OK, we're ready. Brittany Vischer will lead off the discussion on, the, on maximizing hybrid potential with the focus on club root. Brittany is the research director for Alberta Canola, and this past summer, Brittany obtained her master's degree from the University of Alberta with a thesis focused on club root management. Here's Brittany. Awesome. All good? Cool. So good morning, everyone. As Jay introduced myself, my name is Brittany Fisher, and I'm the research director of Alberta Canola. And today, just getting my clever fix and speaking on maximizing your hybrid potential with clever resistant cultivars. So to start off, uh, this is a prairie wide discussion. So I want to, um, just gonna move my back. I just want to do a very quick overview of clever disease uh, as not everyone is on the same familiarity of clever disease. And so there's 3,700 species in the Brassicaceae family that are susceptible to plasmodia of brass, plasmodia for Brassicae, which is uh, the pathogen that causes club root disease. And it's not new. It was seen on cruciferous vegetables in Canada in the 20s and then on oilseed uh, crops in the 60s and 90s. But it wasn't until 2003 that we saw it on canola in Western Canada. So in 2009, we uh, developed our first Clever resistant cultivar that was commercially available. And I'll repeat this again later on, but the genetic basis of most clubber resistant cultivars are not disclosed. So we do assume that the first batch uh, or first generation of clubber resistant cultivars uh, are of the genetic basis with Mendel, which is a European winter rape seed cultivar. And it has a single dominant clubber resistant gene. And so as those came out, those first generation pathotypes, or sorry, cultivars, we had resistance to pathotypes two, three, five, six, and eight. However, with major gene resistance, uh, we, we often see shifts in the pathogen populations. And so in 2013, 
we uh, saw significant clubroot symptoms on clubroot resistant uh, varieties. And when we isolated that pathotype, it was still identifying as five. However, it could overcome that first generation resistance. So we, the Canadian researchers thought we needed to create our own differentiating system to increase our capabilities of identifying them. Um, we initially named this one as 5X, which many people probably heard of uh, when it was first discovered because we were very worried about it. Uh, but we have since discovered many different pathotypes within Canada. And I could talk for quite a few minutes on the CCD set, but that's not the point. Uh, what I wanted to uh, bring your guys' attention to is at the bottom, those pathotypes 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8 have now been identified and a letter has been attached to them as 2F, 3H, 5I, 6M, and 8N. And that is how they're, they're identified on the CCD or the Canadian Clever Differential Set. Also, when you see that, uh, I, for all the C companies I looked at, they do a good job identifying that and attaching that letter. But say if you see something that is resistant to, to five, it doesn't mean that it's resistant to all the pathotypes starting with the number five. It's specifically referring to 5I, for example. And that goes for any two, three, six, or eight uh, pathotypes. We want to make sure we always have a number and a letter associated with them. So uh, with that breakdown, clipper resistant breakdown is uh, quite a misleading term because we don't actually have any breakdown of the genetics itself. Rather, we're just suppressing those specific pathotypes and allowing others to increase. So when we look at the Mendel resistance, uh, this is actually new updated information. Uh, so like I said, unofficially referred to as the first generation cultivars. Uh, Mendel resistant is actually resistant to 18 different pathotypes. So it has a very robust resistance package. Uh, we did add a new pathotype from 2019 and 2020. Uh, however, we did add six more breaking pathotypes or, or pathotypes that um, can overcome Mendel resistance. And so, uh, yeah, seven new pathotypes discovered in 2019 and 2020. So that brings our total to 51 pathotypes that have been identified with the Canadian Clubber Differential Set. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have this for province-wide, but specifically within Alberta, we have 321 fields now with confirmed erosion or breakdown. So we look at second generation or next generation, CR3, multigenetic, second, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what it is, it contains club root resistance that is different from or in addition to Mendel. And so the genetic basis, like I said before, it's not disclosed. So I, I list some examples at the bottom to show you how complicated it can get. So CS2000 is a Cantera variety and it has the what we assume to be the Mendel genetic basis and it has immediate uh, intermediate resistance to 5X, 3O, and 5K. Their other clever resistant variety, CS2600, is also resistant to Mendel with 2, 2B, 5X, 3A, and 3D. So just within one company, they have different resistance. And these are both um, coined as second generation resistance, but both different. Whereas we move into the Bravant 3010M, it has what we see or what it appears to be a similar resistance package to CS2600, but we don't know the exact genetic background uh, and where they source these resistance from. And so we don't know if they have different resistant genes or if they're stacked. Uh, so unfortunately, we just can't confirm whether the source of genetic resistance is the same or not. And that's where second generation gets complicated in uh, referring or recommending them. So what I want everyone to uh, gather from this is that second generation does not automatically mean that it's better. Uh, and especially, it's not a black and white, it's better for every situation or not. Uh, it really depends on your the, the specific field and your management practices and then also within that field what is the predominant pathotype and how are you how are you managing so that we don't have spore buildup and so this is a pretty aggressive or uh, chart um, it's quite complicated but I did add some little cheat notes there on the right hand side and so these are 23 different field samples the galls were collected uh, from the clever resistant cultivars uh, nine novel pathotypes 
for distinguished. And then these are cumulative index of disease percentage. So not against one specific pathotype, but a cumulative. And this is just preliminary results. And so um, Keisha Holman will then go back and also test them against single score isolates of 3H and 3H. Because two appear to be quite susceptible to the old and previously dominant pathotype 3H. Uh, however, that could just be because they have a different resistance uh, background. So we need to grow clobber resistant cultivars and that might seem a little bit contradictory to what I've been saying, but we need to be proactive and we need to incorporate it into an integrated management plan because we need to keep spores low and I'll show you why. So these are just screenshots taken from the life cycle of club root. Uh, and so we look at the canola root, zoom into the root hairs, and even further, that root hairs to the left-hand side, your pea brassic case four, uh, has those flagellas and will then eventually penetrate uh, the, the root hair. And so if we have a mental resistance background and we have a breaking pathotype, uh, this one is actually able to penetrate the root hair. And so on the left-hand side, if we just take that root hair and turn it 90 degrees, it's on the base now going horizontally. Uh, the P. brassicae spore can penetrate um, a Mendel clover resistant cultivar if the pathotype is 3A, whereas the 3H um, has some resistance to it. Now, clover resistant cultivars are not 100% resistant to clover. Uh, the way that they get registered is if they're less than 30% infection compared to the susceptible checks in disease tests. And so in this image, you can see that uh, this plant that is resistant has Mendel resistance background. Uh, the 3A plus modium there, you can see that in the image, but also the 8N, 3H, and 5I can also infect the plant just to a lesser degree. And so gall is comprised of many different pathotypes, but 3A can infect and replicate at a much higher rate than the other pathotypes due to the plant resistance. And so when this gram, um, sorry, when this gall decomposes, it releases billions of spores into the soil and that gram of gall can release around 16 billion, one gram of gall can release up to 16 billion resting spores. And so we have to prevent these large galls from forming and ultimately releasing spores into our soil because, and this is a shameless plug for my research, uh, looking at what is the most effective tool to manage clover? It, of course, is genetic resistance. And so we need to make sure that we manage this tool appropriately so we have it for the long-term plan. And so I don't, uh, I think clover disease is, a very, is very manageable, but we need to be proactive of it, which is why we need to grow clover resistant cultivars before we have a problem with clover. And when I say in an integrated management uh, plan, this is what I mean. Keep spores low, keep spores local, and then managing those patches. Depending on where you farm, you may implement all summer, none of these management strategies. But like I said, it's quite manageable and we need to be proactive. There was a, a, a very, uh, Canola Watch put out a, a good survey on just questioning farmers, what they do uh, to manage club root appropriately. And so prairie wide 50% have a crop rotation of at least two year break. Uh, and this is just to decrease the resting spores by 90%, as research has shown. We need to be proactive and scout, not just scout when we have a problem and you can see it above ground. We need to grow clever resistant cultivars and then also control brassica weeds. And that includes, I should, I should list them out, stink weeds, flicks weeds, shepherd's purse, and mustard. Biosecurity remains to be the most effective tool at managing um, or, or preventing the movement of spores. However, it's a three-step process and it is not practical or realistic between every field during the busy season. About a 12 meter cultivator takes over four hours to complete those three steps. And so we need to be uh, mindful of where the equipment is coming from, maybe taking that three-step if you're buying a new piece of equipment or, um, or sorry, and making sure we're knocking out those big clumps of soil, leaving wet fields because 10 spores can fit across the width of your hair. So there's a ton of spores um, that are in big clumps of soil. And then also reducing tillage. There wasn't this uh, survey put out for uh, patch management, but I was procrastinating writing my thesis and I did put out a survey, very official survey on Twitter. And we have 71% of people who find a patch of club roots um, that aren't pulling it or applying the soil amendment, in addition to 72% um, of it not people not seeding it to grass or marking it off. And so 
in my perfect world recommendation, I would love people to make almost like a metaphorical rock on that, on that patch of club root and uh, seed it to, um, you know, apply some soil and then apply a soil amendment, seed it to grass and mark it off so that we completely avoid uh, disturbing that patch of club root and really allowing that spore load to decrease. So with that, I'm not sure if I've gone over time, but we wanna make sure that uh, we continue or, or we get clubbert resistance in that field. It's the most effective way to keep spores low. And uh, again, it's, very, it's a very manageable disease, but we need to be integrative and proactive uh, to continually grow uh, canola. So. Right on, thanks, Brittany. And thanks for the shameless plug for your research. No problem there. That's why. Uh, that's part of the reason why you're here. And and maybe um, if somebody asks a question, you could talk a bit about the lime side of things because I know in that uh, that graph you had some reference to lime versus no lime. Anyway, we're going to move on. Um, next speaker is Clinton Yerke. Uh, Clint is a colleague of mine. He's the agronomy director for the Canola Council of Canada. He also has extension responsibilities covering the Midwest region of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Clint grew up on a farm near Lloydminster on the Saskatchewan side, and he lives in that same area now. Clint will explain how to choose black leg resistance genes. Here's Clint. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Jay, for the introduction, and thank you all for, uh, for attending this, this webinar. Yeah, so... I guess the question is, is why are we talking about black leg when we're talking about uh, selecting the right cultivar for the right field, which is one of our, our key agronomic priorities uh, for the canola industry is, is that if we can do a better job at choosing the right product for each field, then, uh, then we believe that uh, yields are, are certainly going to go up and grow our profitability will grow up. So black leg, like black leg is is a big deal. And, and even though you might not see it in every field, uh, if you're looking for it, it is a big deal. Like black leg is the number one uh, canola disease worldwide. And it used to be the biggest disease here in the prairies until about 2000, when new resistance came out and, and did a really good job at controlling the disease for about 10 years. But in the last 10 years, black leg has been going up and black legs become a trade issue with, with China and we uh, need to, to do a better job at, at managing uh, this disease, not only for our overall productivity, but for profitability and, and for our, our trade situation. So to manage black leg, we have a, a five step process of increasing your rotation. So the amount of time in between canola crop allows the disease to decompose, uh, do a better job at identifying the disease in the field. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail. But what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about is the use of, of resistant cultivars or varieties and managing those resistant sources, those resistance genes, so that they will last a long period of time. And there are some fungicides that, that uh, are actually uh, showing a lot of promise as well. But let's go straight to scouting. So we, we need to scout for this disease, uh, not only just to identify if the pathogen is there or not there, but to quantify it, to know if it is an increasing problem on a farm or within a field. And knowing how much disease is there is, is going to be really important to not only uh, production and yield, but to know about profitability. Just in the, in the last year, uh, we've, we've launched a new tool on the canola calculator. So if you go to canolacalculator.ca, there's a black leg yield loss calculator, which will tell us specifically, and, and actually the, the model that it's used in this, which was funded with grower levy dollars, has, is really robust. And it was research done at the University of, of Alberta, which quite specifically tells us how much yield is, is being lost if you go out and, and cut stems at the end of the season and rate them on, on a zero to five scale. This uh, model will as well that you put in that rating, uh, you put in how much yield you expect that that field should be uh, receiving, but uh, it will as well, uh, if you put in the, the price that you expect to receive, will give us a financial result. And, Knowing these numbers are really critical for you to determine uh, how successful you are at, at managing this, this disease. 
in the longer term. So scouting for the disease, uh, measuring its yield is, is quite important, but where I want to spend most of my time is, is actually talking about resistance and choosing the right cultivar based upon resistance. Now you're probably aware of, of like the R, MR, MS, and S categories of, of black leg resistance. They've been used since the 80s. And essentially what it is, is that plant pathologists at the end of the season, they go out, cut stems, like what we're encouraging agronomists and growers to do. And they calculate the amount of infection and then compare that to a susceptible check, which is uh, an old variety from uh, the late 80s called West Star. And on the basis of that, you can categorize the, the amount of resistance. But this label, it's, it's while it gives us a, a general idea of, of how that product or that cultivar is going to perform uh, across the prairies, it is based upon three or four black leg nurseries that are spread across the prairies. And it gives us an average rating of, of how that, that will perform. It does not tell us specifically how this uh, product is going to perform in a given field for, for black leg. And that is the reason why we, we've, uh, that there's some new resistance labels that, that have come uh, and are being used in the marketplace. <clears throat> Before I talk about these new labels, I need to really define the, the two types of resistance that are, are present in, in canola. One type of resistance is called major gene resistance. The other type is, is called quantitative resistance for adult plants or minor gene resistance. The major gene resistance is, is kind of like a, a light switch. It's an on or off. If the, if the resistance gene recognizes that the pathogen is starting that infection in the plant, it turns on its resistance and kills the pathogen. So there's no more infection that essentially stops, it turns it right off. Well, adult plant resistance or quantitative resistance is more like a dimmer switch. The more resistance genes you got, the more it will slow down the disease progression within the plant. Plant still gets infected, it still has disease, but the more resistance that's there, the more it slows it down. So that's why it's called the quantitative amount. But with that uh, major gene resistance, um, that pathogen needs to be detected by the plant for this resistance to work. And so that major gene has to recognize that pathogen. If it doesn't, like the pathogen somehow gets around it, then it still gets infected. And so that's where it becomes tricky. And that's why there's some new black leg resistance labels that have, have recently come to, to the marketplace. And that's, that's uh, these labels, uh, RGA, RGB, RGC. And sometimes we just call them A, B, C, D. The RG stands for resistance group, and they refer to specific resistance genes. Now, in this uh, snapshot from the Manitoba Seed Guide, you can see that under the black leg resistance, there's two columns, uh, a resistance rating, which are all R's. So this is that field rating that, that all seed companies do to get a variety registered. There's also the resistance group column. And you might notice that at the top, uh, we have uh, this Brett Young variety as an example that has CE1. So that means it has two different uh, resistance genes that are in it, uh, resistance gene C and resistance gene E1. And there's other cultivars out there that are, that'll have like AE2 or AG. So when you have multiple uh, RG labels there, then that means there's multiple resistance genes within those varieties. So that's good. Uh, these labels have been agreed by all seed company uh, experts within their, within their organizations that these are the, the right labels that, that we should be using as, as an industry. And so they are showing some pretty good uh, efficacy for, for dealing with the disease. But here's where we run into the problem is, is stewardship. We need to make these resistance genes durable and last into the long haul. But unfortunately, what happens is that when we overuse a resistance gene in a field or over spread over a wide geography, the pathogen will change and then that resistance will, will no longer be functional. And, and we saw this happen with the very first type of resistance that came to market, which was in a variety in 1995 called Quantum. It had that RGC uh, resistance, so the resistance group C. And it was used very widely by most seed companies uh, across the prairies. And what's happened is, the, as a result, the pathogen has changed so that that resistance gene no longer works uh, across. So that C group uh, is essentially a, a non-functional resistance gene. So we need to avoid that from happening uh, with the rest of the resistance groups that, that, we're, that we're using out there. If we overuse one resistance gene in a field, 
uh, we can certainly erode uh, that resistance. So the, the good news is that we have a tool for, for detecting what specific races of the pathogen are, are present in the field. And this uh, work was funded as well by grower levy dollars. And we really want to thank the, the growers for funding this because now there's three or four labs across the, the prairies where you can send samples and they will tell you specifically what races are, are present in, in, a, uh, in the pathogen population. So as an example, here we have a field that has three races uh, the AVR LM2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 7, 11, that's one race, and it comprises 25% of the population. This uh, race comprises 50% of the population, and this race has 25%. So there's three races that were detected in this field. What these labels or numbers with these AVR LM uh, numbers refer to is which resistance genes will be effective at controlling it. So the red highlighted one indicates that RLM4, which is resistance group D, will control all of these uh, pathotype races that are, that are in the field. And we have other uh, races uh, here, or, or avirulence genes here that correspond to a resistance gene 11 that uh, does not yet exist. But the good news is, is that uh, researchers are working on bringing uh, new types of resistance to the marketplace. So this resistance uh, gene RLM11 is uh, currently being developed and funded by SAS Canola to uh, put this gene into canola varieties so that we'll have a, another type of resistance uh, eventually for, for, for the marketplace. So I, hoping that I'm, I'm not running out of time, but I, I do want to wrap things up that when it comes to picking out the right cultivar, you really need to understand what's happening within the field. You need to know what uh, diseases you have. Do you have club roots? Do you have sclerotinia? Do you have black leg? And what types of resistance you've used in the past because we want those resistance genes to last a, a long uh, period of time. So selecting the right cultivar for the right fields to manage these, uh, these different pathotypes, these different races that are present in the field is gonna be our, our key to being successful. And so when we think of like how much yield loss can be uh, experienced by a, a disease, like in club root, uh, when the disease is really high, 50% yield losses are possible. Black leg, maybe not quite that high anymore, but still some very high levels that when you are experiencing 10, 15, 20% yield loss, that is often a loss that's gonna be much greater than, than the yield potential of, of a variety. So don't always select a variety or cultivar on the basis of yield. Take a look at what's the threat within the field and picking the right product that's going to deal with it is one of our keys to success. That's what I want to wrap things up. Thanks, Jay. Right on. Thanks, Clint. I was thinking uh, I made a note about your good analogy on the on off switch for the major genes and the dimmer switch for the minor genes. And then I noticed in the chat that someone else also thought that was an excellent analogy. So good. You'll have to, you'll have to keep using that one. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, and of course, um, I don't think a canola grower would grow canola without black leg resistance. And so um, just to relate that back to Brittany's presentation, we're hoping that uh, uh, sometime soon uh, farmers take the same approach with regard to club root resistance. Okay, we're moving on. Uh, we now have a, a presentation from Nicola Dow. Nicola farms at Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, and is a director with Manitoba Canola Growers. And Nicola was involved in the development of a new pod shatter rating system for canola cultivars. And she explains how the system works. Here's Nicola. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicola Dow. I'm a farmer from near Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, and I'm also one of the directors of Manitoba Canola Growers. Today, I get to talk to you about the new canola shadow rating, which is a group that I've had the privilege of chairing the, the committee that's developed this rating. And so I'm excited to share it with you today. Now, the canola shadow rating is a, a new tool that will help farmers with managing the risk of shatter loss in their canola. And to start off, I want to give you a bit of the background of how this came to be, not just what it is, but how it came to be. And the, the 2020 growing season was really critical to this process happening. Um, 
the last number of years have been really challenging for a lot of farmers across the prairies and 2020 was no exception. Um, there was a lot of challenges going on in our world, but on the farm, we experienced some really extreme heat, some extreme drought, and at least in Manitoba, extreme wind. And all of that came together to create really the perfect storm for shatter loss. And so on my farm, just like on the farms of many others, we went to harvest our canola and had a lot of loss. There were pods all over the ground. And even though we had been straight cutting for a number of years, this was something new. We hadn't experienced loss like this before, and we had a lot of questions about it. And so following harvest, when our Manitoba Canola Growers Board met, it was one of our big topics of discussion. And we wanted to do something about it to help and support our members. And so we brought a motion forward to the WCCRRC. It isn't quite in their purview, but it was a group where all of the right people were together. And so with the support of um, the other two provinces, farmer canola groups, um, as well as the WCCRRC committee, we got a green light to go ahead and work on developing a rating. So there was a subcommittee that had already been in place um, we re revitalized it with myself as the new chair. Um, and that group was made up of representation for farmers from all three provinces, as well as really broad representation from across the seed and breeding industry, along with um, some support folks. So people from the Canola Council, people from Egg Canada. And it was a, a really diverse group that was able to come together and look at the needs that farmers had in the field and also consider what the needs were of the seed companies and um, to start clarifying a lot of the misunderstanding that had happened <laughs> in 2020. And there were a lot of things that I learned and um, things I hadn't realized and things that we realized maybe a lot of farmers hadn't considered. And so we were able to develop not just a rating but also an education plan to go along with it. And this whole process was really a huge success in the collaboration of the canola industry. Um, farmers had a need in the field um, as kind of their voice. Our provincial commodity group was able to bring that need forward and get the support of the industry and bring everyone together to work um, together to address the issue. So, the committee that came together, we had a lot of discussion about what would a valuable risk assessment tool look like. Um, it's something that is voluntary. Seed companies do not have to use this rating, but we wanted to develop something that was really good and that worked for everyone so that they would want to, um, because that would be the most successful outcome of this. And so we decided to develop a risk assessment tool that would represent a canola cultivar's um, relative risk of shatter. So it's not about a percentage of loss or anything like that, but um, about risk. And we set two designated checks that would anchor our scale. Um, we chose cultivars that both are familiar to farmers and also to breeders that would work well as anchor points. The scale itself is a one to nine scale with one being a very high risk of shatter and nine being a very low risk of shatter. And you can see that we have those two cultivars that are our anchor points marked in there. So anything that would be falling in a one to four range is something that a grower would definitely want to be swapping. These are cultivars that wouldn't be suitable for straight cut. And anything that has a five or higher, it doesn't mean you have to straight cut it, but it's something that would be kind of in that suitability range and that a farmer um, or an agronomist giving a recommendation can use those numbers to um, assess the risk going on in their field and make the management decision that's best for their farm. So these shadow ratings are important. They don't change the genetics, they don't change the environment or what will happen in your field but it is a valuable tool in helping to set expectations and giving farmers something tangible 
um, in managing harvest operations. And if you're working with multiple cultivars, having a bit more of an idea what to expect. If you're trying out something new, again, having an expectation in place. And again, it's a voluntary rating. And so it's something that's been really vital to work with everyone across the industry on to find something that works for everyone um, and make it a great solution that um, can be readily available for farmers. All right, thanks, Nicola. Just as, as a reminder, uh, if you have a question, you can add it to the, uh, the Q&A or use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen there and uh, pose your question. All right, Aaron Willenberg is with Winfield United Canada, providing something just covered up my screen, providing a strategic direction on agronomy and field market field market development across Canada. Aaron lives on a small farm near Floral, Saskatchewan, and Aaron will provide tips on how to evaluate each field to prioritize which canola traits are most important. Here's Aaron. Yeah, right on, Jay. Um, so just to, to kick things off, Jay had, uh, had sent me a couple questions just to talk through today. I didn't put a, a presentation together, but to talk through in terms of how to uh, choose the right canola cultivar for each field. And, and he first of all asked me to talk about, is that possible to have the right canola cultivar for, for each field? And, and I do think it is possible. And I think it's something that we should add to our, to our decision-making process. I think having a, a conversation about choosing the right cultivar for each field really helps, uh, helps growers and agronomists to, to think a little bit differently about the hybrids they're selecting. You know, I think it's easy to say, uh, is this variety of club root resistance? Is it a high yielder? Perfect, let's, uh, let's move on. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. I, you know, I think there's something to be said for, for risk management as well and diversifying your hybrid selection. You know, reflecting on this year, I think folks, some folks wish they would have uh, looked at some different maturities. You know, maybe we could have chose a, a real early hybrid that was, uh, was done flowering before the, the heat of mid-July set in. Um, you know, some growers try new hybrids every year. Uh, and, and that's great, but I think it's more uh, starting to think about why you're choosing those hybrids and how they may perform on certain fields is, is, is pretty important. Um, you know, Jay asked me to talk a little bit about how farmers, you know, prioritize genetic traits on their farm and, and on, on each field. And I think one thing we need to, to realize and wrap our heads around is that there's a lot of great canola hybrids out there. If you look at the 2020 uh, canola performance trials, for example, there was 16 replicated sites. And, and if you look within each herbicide system, there's really only a 4% variance in yield amongst both hybrids. So there's a lot of great choice and a lot of yield, uh, great yield potential hybrids on, on the market today. And, and those hybrids had a variety of options in, in herbicide resistance, disease resistance, and now perhaps shatter tolerance ratings, of course, maturity and standability, and, and they all yielded really well. So I think it's about digging a little bit deeper into that field history and, and looking at things like rotations, weed spectrum, and the disease history as, uh, as Clint and Brittany talked about a bit today, and, and starting to couple that with with experiences, trial data, and, and grower management to, to try to decide what's in, important. And I think it's cool to start to maybe get a bit more prescriptive with, with hybrid selection. I know that's the common in corn, and I think that's something we could, could look at trying here. You know, if a grower is only seeding one hybrid, I would encourage them to, to try something new and, and think about why, not just something new for the sake of trying something new, so looking at some of the new genetics that, that you can, can introduce. And another example of that would be, you know, if a, a grower's management practice always uh, has them spraying quite late in the season, should we be moving a few acres over to the TruFlex uh, system where you can spray uh, a bit later? You know, of course, staying on top of weeds and, and spraying them early is, is super important, but, uh, 
you know, if, if that is part of your yearly management that you do get behind on spring because you have a lot of acres, let's let's think about that and think about how that can be part of our, our decision making. Um, one other thing that, that Jay wanted me to touch on was using genetic resistance traits in the in the canola hybrid selection process. And he asked specifically about black leg and, and club root and how do farmers make the right decision on those traits. And I tried to to answer that in, in one quick sentence, but it's it's really not that easy. I think, you know, first of all, no matter what the disease, the grower, the agronomist needs to be out there scouting and, and paying attention and having good record keeping systems. I know there's a ton of them out there that, that people use to various degrees, but certainly keeping track of, of disease incidence and, and severity as well as what hybrid you've been using is, is pretty important. So um, maybe I'll make a couple comments on black leg and a, and a couple on club root and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Jay, but certainly on black leg, um, Clint, Clint went through those uh, major gene resistance packages and, and chose what showed what was available. But you know, if you don't have the field records of, of what you were using or what the specific R gene package was, you know, what could you do instead? So, you know, if you've always been using one company or one R gene, perhaps there is an opportunity to switch if you if you see that what you're currently doing isn't working. Um, you know, you can certainly ask the company if they're not publicly sharing their R genes, if, if they know if it would be a good fit for you or if they have really strong minor gene resistance. I think that's a, a conversation you could you could have as well. Um, you know, I, I know pathology is really different from, from herbicide resistance, but we're really good at paying attention to what herbicides we're using and people are documenting it. Don't use too many group twos. Don't use group nine too often. Make sure you're tank mixing. And that's kind of a common conversation, but you know, genetic resistance, especially around black leg, it's, it's not that common yet. So keeping those notes on what are the major resistance genes that you're using, or at least the varieties or hybrids that you're, you're growing, at least you'll have those notes if, if something's going wrong and you, you need to look back. Um, of course, Clint talked about the, the IPM approach for, for black leg. And so genetics is only one small part of that discussion. You know, fungicide seed treatment like Saltro can certainly help, help to manage that. So genetics is an important part of the conversation and it's really built on, on field scouting and, and understanding what you've used in the past. Now, just a, a couple of comments on, on club root and I'll I'll wrap it up here, but we know with club root, it's super important to take a proactive approach, right? Um, Brittany alluded to it a couple of times, using resistance as part of that proactive approach is, is super important to keep those spore levels uh, low and local. You know, we always encourage farmers to use a, a club root resistant variety, even if they don't think they have club root. Those early infestations can be missed for years while the pathogen builds up to damaging levels. So. You know, using a club root resistant variety, I feel like that's the easy part of the conversation, but it's often overlooked that, uh, that resistance is not immunity, okay? So to have a R rating to club root, um, what that means is that the variety has to have less than 30% disease infection con compared to a susceptible variety. So those club root resistant sources can still get it infected and it's important to really keep keep scouting. And you know, there's areas where our pathotype composition is is diverse. And you know, maybe we thought for a while that we only had one pathotype, but when we started to look back into those those goals, it was a diverse set of pathotypes. So we really, really need to be focusing on stewardship in in combination with genetics. And you know, it's an easy decision to choose club root resistance. There's a lot of great hybrids on the market today, but certainly around uh, club root, it, it is more of a discussion on, a, on an IPM approach. And I guess just a, a quick word on, on second generation resistance. In, you know, in areas where first generation has been grown a number of times, um, we're starting to move to the tough conversations about second generation. And why are these conversations hard? Well, there's not a lot of information that's publicly available on the source of this second generation resistance. And, 
you know, lots of people are talking about new resistance or second generation and, and agronomists and I think growers are wondering, is this all the same source? And you know what, it probably isn't. And are all of these new generation resistance, um, are they resistant to the same pathotype? And again, it probably isn't. So I think what can we actually do when we, when we don't have all the information? I think it's really important to keep record of what hybrid you are using and the resistance source if known. You know, if you're choosing a new resistance source, try to find out, um, you know, what club root pathotype it's resistant to. And eventually I think the technology will be really readily available to, to be able to understand what pathotypes you have in your field. So I know it's, it's not easy today to figure out your club root pathotype. I know some work's being done at the U of A um, and just switching to a, to a new source of resistance might not be the right choice. Like Brittany showed a little bit of, of research on that that wasn't totally completed yet, but you know, in some cases that, that could be a worse choice. So I know you'd love for me to, to tell you all the answers, but uh, we just don't quite have enough uh, information to know for sure. So just to sum that up, I would say scouting, record keeping and working really closely with your genetic supplier to, to understand what they're offering. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, those conversations with your, your seed suppliers is a good idea because they, they will often know things about uh, a cultivar that aren't advertised. And uh, I know with, with regard to, say, uh, heat tolerance, you know, there, is, there are differences between cultivars and some, some of those seed suppliers might, might be able to help. I'm not saying they will, but they might be able to. Aaron, I, I want to keep you on just for one second, then we'll bring Brittany and Clint in as well for this Q&A session. So what, what we'll do uh, just for, for the listeners out there, we'll, we'll have about 12 minutes of Q&A, and then I'll ask the three of you to give a, a 30 second closing comment, just your, your key point you want people to remember today, and then we'll sign off. But Aaron, uh, so days to maturity with a cultivar came up a few times this, this year, trying to get ahead of heat if, if possible um and, and for particularly during the flowering stage of canola do you have any advice uh for farmers and agronomists on on the days to maturity choice sure yeah that's a that's an interesting one so growers of course are are aware of what growing season zone they're in so in the short season you're often limited but in the long season you do have an opportunity to uh to choose different uh, different lengths of season and you know if I told you to grow a short season variety in a long season zone the heat would probably come at exactly the wrong time so it is very hard to predict when that that heat's going to come but my best advice would be to to change it up a little bit and to perhaps consider some varieties that are a little bit of a longer season and and have some that are shorter season to to really um, make sure you don't have all your eggs in one basket so to speak. Yeah, great. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, I've got a question for Clint on the resistance genes uh, labels for black leg. So it, with that example you gave, Clint, that chart, a lot of the, the hybrids or cultivars didn't have uh, a gene identified. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, you're, if a, you're a farmer buying one of those, how, how do you know what gene it has? Or... Yeah. or <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so that, that is a challenge, uh, certainly. Uh, we, we know that not all cultivars or varieties or hybrids or whatever you want to call them have, have, the, uh, have the R gene labels for, for black leg out there. Uh, and so what we are encouraging uh, producers and agronomists to do is, is, is to talk to uh, the seed company that directly as to what they would recommend uh, for, for rotating uh, it, it between their, their products. I, I know like the, the Due to limits of time, I didn't really have an opportunity to talk about uh, quantitative resistance very much. Um, most seed companies in, in most of their products do have that quantitative resistance. So that's that dimmer switch uh, resistance operating in the background. And, and a lot of times they'll have like an R gene stacked on top of that uh, quantitative resistance. But the, one of the challenges as an industry, we don't know we don't have a way of, of measuring that, that quantitative resistance, how much is in there just yet. We're maybe still a year away from, from having a, that technology or that, that rating uh, available. So in the, in the meantime, 
what we are encouraging growers to do is, is to have a conversation with the seed company directly to find out what they would recommend in that situation if they believe that their quantitative resistance is sufficient enough. But unfortunately, it's, it's hard to know uh, exactly how those products are, are going to perform in a specific field uh, and until one, you, you know what the races are there and then two, what, what the major resistance genes are. Then you can have a very, uh, a very good idea of, of how to manage that risk. Um, so it's, it's still a little bit buyer beware, unfortunately, with, with some of those products that are still out there. Thanks, Clint. All right, so we're going to come back to you with this next question, Clint, but I want to give it to Brittany first. All right, it, actually, it's, and so it's very timely. It has to do with the dry, dry last year. Um, all right, so with the dry conditions in, in 2021 and, and even before that in, in some areas, uh, so the question is about clubroot and blackling spores coming out of those dry years. Here's the question. If we return to normal moisture levels, at what part of the growth cycle of the canola plant is moisture going to elevate the spore load of both club root and black lake? Okay, do you, can, okay. You, can you address that, Brittany? Partially. So there was quite a few questions that came up this year with, with the dryness and how the spores respond. And if we, I don't know, not necessarily solve club root, but if the spore load has drastically reduced, there isn't a ton of research yet on dry conditions or the, the timely amounts of moisture, um, but I can tell you this. So dry conditions do not kill spores, club root spores specifically. Um, I'm only speaking of club root. <laughs> so uh, dry spores do not, or sorry, dry conditions do not kill spores, but we do know moist conditions increase the germination of spores and then also those flagellas on the zoospores require water to move to the host. So when we remove that, we're not getting the germination. And then if any spores do uh, germinate, they have to get to the host by swimming. So um, clubroot is actually quite surprisingly difficult to grow if you don't have the appropriate conditions. So if you have a cooler environment or it's uh, quite dry. Clint has seen uh, probably more clubroot than you might have thought in a dry year. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't out in the field as much, but I saw in my greenhouse, I had like a billion spores per gram of soil uh, and I didn't water it at the appropriate time and I had no club root symptoms. However, we do also know with um, canola and the spores that the, the plants are most susceptible at a younger stage and we need very few days to have that secondary infection um, in, a, in a like optimal environment, it only needs seven days post inoculation to create those gall, galling symptoms on the canola plant. So um, yeah, a couple dry years is not going to really help us specifically with club root. Um, once we get that moisture in the spring or over the winter, they're just going to be, yeah, they're going to, they're going to be go going. Yeah. Okay. Clint, what about dry years in Black Lake? Yeah, so um, I agree with with Brittany is that that we had a little bit of a reprieve this year for for a lot of the diseases sclerotinia and black lake club root were all down, um, but that pathogen population is still there and it's 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 waiting for us. So once we get back to kind of wetter conditions, we will we'll expect to see a resumption of the, of those diseases. But the, there is one other disease, and and that's uh, verticillium stripe, which is predominantly in Manitoba creeping westward as, as, as time goes on. That pathogen seem to do just fine in, in the really dry conditions and reproduce uh, quite a bit. So un unfortunately, uh, we can expect that the, the diseases are still gonna be there even coming out of a drought. Hey Clint, just to stay with the hybrid theme or the cultivar selection theme, do we know anything about uh, differences between cultivars for verticillium resistance? Not yet. Um, we're, we're, the, the verticillium research is still in its infancy. We, we, we don't even have a good model for yield loss just yet. We're hoping that that should be done here this year. And then from that, we, we should have a, a screening methodology that we can start uh, putting cultivars or varieties, hybrids through to determine how much resistance that there potentially is. We are getting some indications that there might be some resistance in the germplasm, um, but it's it's really early days to, to know for sure. Um, just keep an eye on this space because unfortunately 
verticillium, I think, is is joining the the big three canola diseases to become the big four, and it's going to be something we'll have to come up with some solutions on as time goes. Okay, well, I'm going back to you again, Clint, with a black leg question. Um, does quantitative resistance stop the black leg pathogen from reproducing? Uh, good question. No, it doesn't. Uh, major gene resistance does, um, but quantitative resistance, the pathogen still gets into the plant, still is present in the canola residue at the end of the season. And therefore, once that plant is dead, then it, it grows saprophytically. So decomposing dead tissue and, and is able to, to reproduce and produces more spores. So relying so, solely on quantitative resistance, unfortunately, it does increase the pathogen load in a field uh, as compared to major gene. The ultimate solution is, is actually having a quantitative resistance, which slows the disease down, put the major gene on top that, that is good against those races. And then you've, you've got the, the full package that, that works really, really well. Lots of science that shows that the stack of those two systems is the best. All right, question. one more question for you, Aaron. And then Brittany, I'm coming back to you with one on, uh, on being proactive, but we'll do Aaron's question first. Uh, and this is a good one. Um, and it's, it, it, it's not necessarily a, a trait decision, although it could be a treatment decision. Uh, so are these products that claim to enhance root development and then improve yields ultimately? Um, what, what do you think of those? Or is it still best uh, to <laughs> stick with a balanced fertilizer program until we know more about these other products? Yeah, it's a, amazing how many of those products come out of the woodwork when there's a high fertilizer prices. So um, for my, from my perspective, I would look at these with a bit of a skeptical eye. Maybe that's uh, just my nature, but that's how I would approach them. Um, I'd ask for some, some really good, robust um, trial data, uh, hopefully some scientific research that would explain the process by which uh, these products perhaps lead to uh, to yield enhancements. You know, it's one thing to show a great picture of a of a bigger root, and and roots are important for water uptake, for nutrient uptake. But a slightly bigger root in one side by side picture with a ruler is not going to uh, to result in yield increases across your field. Um, you know, sometimes I have products come across my desk that say look how great this improved yields in rice in the Southern US. It will definitely work in canola and in Saskatoon. And I just shake my head. So it's certainly buyer beware with those, but by all means, if you wanna try something on your farm, I always encourage people to do a test strip and, and check it out, but do be careful. And certainly in a year with, uh, with high fertilizer prices, just, just keep, your, keep your eyes out. All right. So, Aaron and, and Clint, think about your your sign off question because or your 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 last words because they have one more question and then we're going to be done. And Brittany, this is for you. So, just and and this will be you emphasizing a point you already made, but I think there's a lot of farmers in areas where club root really hasn't been a major problem yet. Um, so the message to use club root resistance perhaps doesn't make sense. <laughs> but but the keeping spores low, this is this is where I want to go. Um, so how would you, you know, describe why uh, all farmers should consider clever resistance uh, uh, with that goal of keeping spores low? Why is that so important? Yeah, so I think we need to um, be honest with ourselves as to how much we're actually scouting. And um, are we going to every field every year, pulling roots, pulling plants, going to those high risk areas? Um, it is a soil borne disease. There can be mm, quite a bit of spores in the soil uh, without seeing even symptoms on the plant. So when we increase spore load in the soil and then see these above ground symptoms, which are typically now close to a million spores per gram of soil for them to affect the plants above noticeably. Um, and then we subject those resistant cultivars to that sort of pressure. We're gonna have a break. Well, we can break down these genetics in just two growing seasons. Yes, two. So, and on the third cycle, you'll start to see the breakdown. That's what I'm trying to say. So we don't want to expose these cultivars to such high pressure after we found these 
really, I guess, infected areas and then use it. Um, and so I suggest, yeah, we're, we should, it should just be almost like a, a black leg. Um, it should just be involved in, in, in every cultivar so we can avoid those high risk situations uh, for creating new pathotypes or I shouldn't say creating, but for identifying, identifying those novel pathotypes that resistance has not maybe been um, commercialized yet for it or to the same robustness as the Mendel resistance package. So um, there's a lot to learn about this resistance. Um, Mendel seems to be extremely, has a lot of uh, pathotyping, um, resistant to a lot of pathotypes, uh, but we don't know how durable all the other packages are yet. So we just need to try to keep it that that resistance as long as possible. And that's just to decrease pressure uh, on those resistance genetics and fields. So by keeping spore lips low, I rambled. Yeah, that's it. Well, with something so complex as Clevered, it's not hard to, to get going. Uh, okay, we're going to go in reverse order 30 seconds each, and then I'm going to sign off and we'll be done. Uh, so, Aaron, you were uh, the last to present, so you get to do your 30-second sign-off first. Sure. I think uh, my my main comment would be that there's a lot that's not known yet about uh, how to manage club root, and our researchers are have a lot on the go right now, so I would encourage agronomists and farmers really to keep their ear to the ground, to pay attention to the new research that that's coming out and try to work to uh, include that in, in your decision making. Just because you you believe something about club root or black leg today doesn't mean it'll necessarily be true in two years or five years from now. So try to stay on top of the research and the new extension messaging and, and use that in your hybrid decision making. Good, thanks Aaron. Clint. Yeah, my final message is, yeah, don't grow one cultivar across your entire farm. Uh, like. I think that the industry we're moving more and more to more precision and thinking of fields as as management zones and even getting down to per square foot levels. We need to be thinking more strategically about our, our varieties that we're growing and, and Aaron certainly indicated that we need to think uh, more precisely in, in a holistic fashion. I know that for 2022 seed decisions are mostly made right now, but we have an opportunity for 2023 that if you do a really good job at spending time in the field scouting for what are the real yield robbers that you're experiencing, um, really understand what is happening in those fields, you can select which traits will be able to correct that more specifically for 2023 so that once you start making those decisions in the fall, uh, you'll make the better decisions and have a really good year in 2023. So good luck out there. Good. Thanks, Clint. Brittany, last word. Okay, mine's more clever specific. Theirs were very broad, great. Um, but I want uh, people to think of clever almost like black leg, not to be, not to have such a, I wish it, there wasn't such a negative stigma around it so that people could talk about it more. Um, you know, also look at cultivars and not think that you're gonna have a yield drag or it's gonna cost more for, for having clever um, uh, in that cultivar, or sorry, resistance. Ooh. Uh, and so I just want it to be more of, um, I want it to be more relaxed for people to, to talk about, learn how to manage it. Um, and then, you know, we can hopefully get ahead of this pathogen. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and not worry about it as much. Thanks, Brittany. Okay. There's, there's lots of good, um, agronomy information on the canola encyclopedia for all the topics we talked about today. Uh, Brit or Cass is going to pop up the CCA credit, uh, screen here shortly um yeah but but when it comes to cultivar decisions uh, canolawatch.org canola encyclopedia.ca and we've also talked about it quite a bit in canola digest magazines that's canola digest.ca so i would encourage you to to check out all three of those sources okay there's the cca code to get a credit for this presentation and while that's up i'm going to sign off uh, the next Canola Watch webinar is January 13th, and the topic is Messy Fields to Bigger Yields, Beneficial Insects, Pests, and Canola Crops, and Entomology Research. Registration is open. You can find details at your Provincial Canola Association website or at uh, canolacouncil.org, O-R-G, 
in the events section under the about us tab at the top. Thanks again to Brittany Vischer, Nicola Dow, Aaron Willenberg, and my colleague Clint Yerke for their participation in today's webinar. Thanks to Cass Cardi for her behind the scenes work. And thanks to the host organizations, Canola Council of Canada, Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, and Alberta Canola. I'm Jay Wetter. See you next time. <laughs>